Welcome to the LearnTheHeart.com presentation on atrial fibrillation, Part 1, Introduction, Pathophysiology, and Etiology, Complete Cardiology in a Heartbeat. Atrial fibrillation is the most common chronic arrhythmia. Some reports estimate that approximately 2 to 3 million people in the United States have atrial fibrillation. Atrial rates between 400 and 600 beats per minute are present in patients with atrial fibrillation. Of course, not all 4 to 600 of these beats actually reach the ventricles. The AV node acts to block many of these beats from reaching the ventricles. The resultant ventricular rate is approximately 100 to 170 beats per minute in somebody who's not being treated with any AV blocking agents. Atrial fibrillation's finding on an EKG, which is the best way to diagnose it, is the absence of P waves and an irregularly irregular QRS complex. Frequently, fibrillatory waves can be seen. With atrial fibrillation, the symptoms that manifest are all related to the decreased cardiac output that occurs in this state. Patients with atrial fibrillation lose their atrial mechanical activity. Contraction of the atrium is very important to help augment left ventricular diastolic filling and maintain a normal cardiac output in most people. This becomes even more important with age as the left ventricle stiffens with time. The rapid ventricular rates that occur in atrial fibrillation also end up reducing the cardiac output. This is actually contradictory to the normal equation for cardiac output, which is heart rate times stroke volume. The reason is, is the heart rates that can occur, as previously mentioned, between 100 and 170 beats per minute, are more than the normal physiologic heart rate in many of the elderly people who have atrial fibrillation. So for example, if you have an 80 year old patient who has atrial fibrillation with a heart rate of 170, that ends up decreasing their cardiac output despite having a faster heart rate. There is a shorter time for diastolic filling because as the heart rates get faster, diastole shortens, systole shortens as well, but to a much lesser degree. So with a combination of loss of atrial mechanical activity and rapid ventricular heart rates, the cardiac output significantly decreases. This results in congestive heart failure, which manifests as dyspnea, edema, orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, and fatigue. Palpitations can occur as well as a result of the rapid ventricular rates. It's very important to distinguish atrial fibrillation from a very similar arrhythmia called atrial flutter. Atrial fibrillation, as we previously mentioned, manifests as a lack of defined P waves on the ECG and an irregularly irregular QRS complex. We could see the coarse atrial fibrillation activity, but no definite P waves. In contrast, atrial flutter does have definite P waves, frequently in a classic, quote, sawtooth pattern. This sawtooth pattern is very common for atrial flutter, but not always seen. Frequently, atrial flutter looks regular, although this example here is irregular. This has a variable conduction of the atrial activity to the ventricles. In certain areas here, it's a 4 to 1 conduction. In other areas, it's a 5 to 1 conduction. Again, frequently atrial flutter looks very regular, which helps to distinguish it from atrial fibrillation. This is a very important distinguishing factor to make, in specifically in regards to the approach to treatment. Both of these arrhythmias increase the risk of thromboembolism, as we will see later on, but atrial flutter is markedly easier to ablate than atrial fibrillation. So atrial fibrillation increases the risk of thromboembolism, which is a very important thing to consider. In this situation, as the left atrium loses its mechanical contraction, flow velocities within the left atrium, and specifically within the left atrial appendage, decrease. This leads to stagnation of blood, allowing the platelets to aggravate, aggregate and rouleau formation to occur. Frequently on a transesophageal echo, you may see what's called spontaneous echo contrast from this rouleau formation. This can eventually result in thrombus formation, and if this thrombus embolizes, it most frequently goes to the brain where it results in stroke. Stroke from car in a cardioembolic source, specifically from atrial fibrillation, is the third leading cause of stroke in the United States behind ischemic strokes and hemorrhagic strokes. On rare occasion, 
thromboemboli can occur from the left atrial appendage to the mesenteric vessels resulting in mesenteric ischemia, to the extremities resulting in critical limb ischemia, or to the kidneys and spleen resulting in infarction in those organs. So the risk of thromboembolism is best determined by the CHADS-2 VASC score. There is also another scoring system simply called the CHADS-2 score, which is largely being replaced by this newer scoring system. The American Heart Association guidelines have their own specific indications for anticoagulation in patients with atrial fibrillation. However, it essentially is very similar to this CHADS-2 VASC score and may eventually become this. So the CHADS-2 VASC score is essentially a mnemonic. The C stands for congestive heart failure. A patient gets one point on the scoring system if congestive heart failure is present. Hypertension, which gives one point if present. Age greater than or equal to 65 gets you one point on the scale, or greater than or equal to 75 gets you two points on the scale. Having diabetes gets you one point. A previous stroke, or TIA, gets you two points. The presence of vascular disease gets you one point, and specifically, this is an old myocardial infarction, peripheral arterial disease, or aortic atheroma. And then a female gender gets you one point. The big distinguishing factors in the CHADS-2 VASC score from that of the CHADS-2 score is the CHADS-2 VASC score includes vascular disease, as the name implies, but also includes female gender. Lastly, the difference includes the age greater than or equal to 75 getting two points, which was not present in the CHADS-2 score. If a patient has two or more points on this scale, then full anticoagulation is recommended. This will be discussed further in the management section. So the terminology for atrial fibrillation is very important in order to clearly communicate the situation that a specific patient is experiencing. Paroxysmal atrial fibrillation is defined as brief atrial fibrillation lasting for less than seven days in duration and spontaneously terminating on its own without intervention, meaning without electrical or chemical cardioversion. Persistent atrial fibrillation is of a longer duration, specifically more than seven days, or it is atrial fibrillation that requires electrical or chemical cardioversion. For example, a patient who comes in has had atrial fibrillation for four or five days and requires an electrical or chemical cardioversion to get back to sinus rhythm. Permanent atrial fibrillation is when atrial fibrillation is always present. As the name implies, there are no plans to convert the patient to sinus rhythm, so there is no plan for a rhythm control strategy. You can call it permanent atrial fibrillation in this situation. It's important to note that the terms chronic atrial fibrillation and recurrent atrial fibrillation are no longer recommended for use. Recurrent atrial fibrillation simply referred to somebody who had more than one episode, which most patients with atrial fibrillation end up having more than one episode. In regards to the pathophysiology of atrial fibrillation, it usually arises from irritable foci causing multiple action potentials, again as previously mentioned, between 400 and 600 beats per minute in the atrium. This is usually located in the pulmonary veins, which is very important in regards to how atrial fibrillation ablation is performed. Less commonly, the focus of the atrial fibrillation can be coming from the right atrium, the superior vena cava, or the coronary sinus. When a patient undergoes ablation for atrial fibrillation, which is also known as pulmonary vein isolation. Not only are the pulmonary veins interrogated very thoroughly, but the right atrium, superior vena cava, and coronary sinuses are, are as well. The electrophysiologist does not want to electrically isolate the pulmonary veins just to find out that the atrial fibrillation was actually arising from a different area. In, patient, in patients with atrial fibrillation, the atrial tissues remodel and some fibrosis and scarring occurs, the left atrium enlarges over time. And that's also important to note in regards to what causes atrial fibrillation, which we will get to shortly. Anything that increases left atrial pressure will slowly result in enlargement of the left atrium. This ends up resulting in this erratic action potentials being created and far scarring and fibrosis of the left atrium.
So the AV node blocks about 50% of the action potentials that occur from the atrium. Of course, if 400 to 600 atrial action potentials all got to the ventricles, then this rhythm would be very hemodynamically unstable and essentially would be ventricular fibrillation. Fortunately, the AV node blocks about 50% of these action potentials, which results in a ventricular rate of about 100 to 170 beats per minute. This is an important thing to note because patients with Wolf-Parkinson's-White syndrome can conduct some of these atrial action potentials, not through the AV node, but through an accessory pathway, which connects the atrium directly to the ventricles. These, this accessory pathway can conduct much faster than the AV node in some of these patients. So instead of 100 to 170 beats per minute reaching the ventricles, a patient with Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome and atrial fibrillation might get between 200 and 250 beats per minute reaching the ventricles. This will be discussed in more detail in the management section under special situations. So a good mnemonic to remember the etiologies of atrial fibrillation is PIRATES. P stands for pulmonary embolus, pulmonary disease, or postoperative. I stands for ischemic heart disease or idiopathic, which could also be termed lone atrial fibrillation. R is rheumatic valvular disease, specifically mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation. A stands for anemia, alcohol, which is also known as holiday heart, age, and autonomic tone, which implies vagal atrial fibrillation. Thyroid disease, specifically hyperthyroidism. And the E stands for elevated blood pressure, which is hypertension. Hypertension is thought to be the most common cause of atrial fibrillation. Electrocution rarely can cause it as well. The S stands for sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is potentially the second leading cause of atrial fibrillation. Sleep apnea causes hypertension, and again, hypertension is the most common cause of atrial fibrillation. Some studies report as much as 50 to 60 percent of patients with atrial fibrillation have sleep apnea. Sepsis and surgery can also cause atrial fibrillation. One specific thing to note that anemia, a hyperthyroid state, and sepsis are all different states of what we call a high cardiac output state. Any high cardiac output state can result in atrial fibrillation due to elevated left atrial pressures. Surgery causes an increased sympathetic state, which can trigger atrial fibrillation. Alcohol use is relatively similar, although there are potentially some other pathophysiologic mechanisms involved as well. Next, atrial fibrillation part two, diagnosis, symptoms of atrial fibrillation, and a focus on management, which will include when to use a rate control strategy versus a rhythm control strategy, and a good discussion on antiarrhythmic drugs, which are frequently challenged to rem challenging to remember. And then at this part two, we'll finish with special situations. Thank you for listening to the atrial fibrillation presentation from LearnTheHeart.com. Complete cardiology in a heartbeat.